day. We've been excited about talking to you tonight about jumping up, dealing with jumping up. Super common challenge, especially if you have an, a hyper energetic athletic dog. A dog that's going to be big. That's Oh, that's huge. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, this is something that we talk about a lot in our classes. You know, a, do a dog that is big already. <laughs> yeah. Well, your dog at eight weeks is very different than your dog at eight months. So mm -hmm. all of the information that they get along the way when we're teaching our puppy at eight weeks uh, or you're teaching your dog at eight months needs to be consistent. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to be consistent with the information, how to stop that nuisance behavior. It's so frustrating. I mean, it's so frustrating when you're in the back of your mind you're always thinking like oh don't come too close to me like oh my goodness you know rover don't jump up um mm -hmm. it, we don't want you to have to be worried about that it's mm -hmm. You know, a big part of what we do here at McCann Dogs is try to get you the information so that you can go more places with your dog, do more things with your dog, spend more time with them, and so that it's like a rewarding, satisfying experience to be a dog owner. And so often, you know, people come to us with like, uh, you know, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know if I can keep the dog. Yeah. It gets to that point for some people. It's also difficult too, like if your dog really jumps up on a lot of people, like I know there's certain like people's houses that I don't like to go to. Because I know when I go there, I'm going to get mauled by the dog. Yeah, for And sure. it's just mauled in an affectionate, affectionate yeah, over yeah, jumped zealous up in like, type of yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, but it's sort of annoying. You know, it's really, it's not fun to be around dogs that are jumping all, all, you know, jumping up all the time. But really, it's not the dog's fault because they don't really know any better. And the thing that we're going to get into a lot tonight, but jumping is such a self-rewarding behavior that that's why so many people struggle with it is because it's tons of fun for the dogs to do. It's very rewarding. And, um, you know, unless we change their mind about what to do and teach them how to make different choices, is, it is something that they don't just grow out of or it doesn't yeah. just magically go oh, away. I love this point. It yeah. gets um it gets it gets worse with time. So that's why it is so so important that you learn about how to address it. Uh, and the earlier you can do it, uh, the better. I find it interesting that um, some people say like, oh just ignore them. Just turn your back. Just ignore them and stop it. And um, in an absence of information, your dogs if they find it gratifying, valuable, worth it to jump up on you. They're going to continue doing it. I've literally seen dogs they just think grab, that's right. like, grab the back of their sweatshirt and tug yeah, on it. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we want to be giving our dog good information so they don't, mm -hmm. they, they uh, learn that it's more valuable to not choose that. But before we get there, I want to know, I see lots of you guys joining us here in the chat. Um, I think, you know what, let's go right here. Let me know where you're joining us from. This is, I'm starting to kind of, sh we're gonna shape the uh, delivery of this information. Now, maybe you're here in uh, Canada with us. Uh, we're in Ontario, <clears throat> we're, maybe you don't know who we are. My name's Ken Steep, this is Kale McCann. We're professional dog trainers at McCann Dogs. And at McCann Dogs, every single week, we help nearly 600 dog owners to overcome the same dog training challenges that you have, things like jumping up, Things like pulling on leash. Not coming when they're called. Not coming when they're called, for sure. Mm -hmm. Learning to sit and stay. Just having better emotional control. But in our train station episodes, we love to take a little deeper dive into the, the dog training. And we love to a answer your questions and, and have these conversations. Because this is the stuff. When you, get, when you understand the why, you can totally have a better shot at the how. You can even start making decisions for yourself about the how. And uh, that's very, very valuable. Now, before we go too much further, I see lots of people joining us. Oh. I see uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Doug, thanks for joining us from Nashville, Indiana, Los Angeles, Australia, Nashville, Garland, Tampa, Texas, Baltimore, Brampton, not Brampton. too far away, Kendra, nice. um, Knoxville, Sydney, Australia, Washington State, Indiana, New Hampshire, Southern California, Lodi, Lodi California, California, Melbourne, California. Melbourne. Australia, I think I said it right. Uh, Connecticut, Edmonton. Uh, Jamaica. Oh, jump. Portland, Oregon. Uh, Oakville, Ontario. Toronto, in, uh, India. Thanks for joining us, uh, our, our beer uh, from India. Um, Picton, Ontario. Granville, New York. Clearwater. Oh goodness, going so Elk fast. Grove, Houston. <laughs> Mingo Junction, Ohio. I love some of these names. This is why I do this. I love finding out oh. where you guys are joining us from. Um, it's just fun for me. Yeah, I would also love to know, um, I saw a few people ch chatting about our 40th anniversary. So um, for those of you who don't know, yeah. uh, this is my family's business. My parents started this business uh, 40 years ago now. And uh, last weekend, we celebrated our 40 year anniversary with a huge celebration at our facility. And um, gosh, it was so much fun. And one of the coolest things for me is getting to meet so many of our online students in person, that was cool, yeah. which yeah. was really, really awesome. So uh, it would be cool to know if you guys uh, joined us and if you um you know interacted either at the facility or or online um but if you check out our instagram channel and stuff we posted all kinds of cool things from what happened it was awesome yeah it was, it was super fun again that's where we were reminded you know 
some people came there said like I can't believe this facility. Yeah. I watched you guys on YouTube. It's pretty cool. I can't believe it's this close. And I, I think so, some people might think exciting. that like we live like just in the train station, but this is only like one this little is a room. Studio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, our studio. Yeah. We have a, a pretty pretty elaborate facility that um, we train close to 500 dogs a week in. Well, with nearly 600. Nearly no, no, yeah. 600 yeah, now. That's no. right. Yep. COVID, see you later. Yeah, I know. Getting back to our normal thing yeah. again. And we now have like the 40 instructors. It's awesome. Because you said COVID. Oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I said it too. So okay. Um, okay, <laughs> let's get let's get down to things. So I want to know, for you at home, what what is your dog jumping on? I think we have a few different things that we want to work on. And um, I mean, maybe it's counters. Maybe it's the couch. Maybe it's people, family members. Maybe it's strangers. It's going to change kind of how we deliver this information. And we'll try to help out as many people as we can. But I'd love to know, what is it? Is it people, uh, couches, maybe the counter? Um, and, and we can start to really get into the uh, uh, <laughs> more specific conversation. I love the interview with your parents and we learned your real name. Shh. Yeah. Quiet, it's Very true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, as people, so let's see this. Now, uh, Keish said uh, jumping on me. Uh, yeah, and, Counters, and also said me. The couch, all of the above. Yeah. Anyone, people. Renee says my grandchildren. So this is one of the mm, reasons good, that we, okay. you know, we want to be really consistent with our information. We want to help you out sooner rather than later. Jane Anderson, one of our Heart Dog supporters. We joined online. The interview with your parents was awesome. Oh, thanks oh, for nice. joining us. Um, okay. It was people, really fun people. to do. Lots of, lots of people. I also see me and Counter often. Yeah. Okay, let's start with Counters. Let's start okay. with Counters and, and then we'll we'll move in a little bit to uh, spreading it out a little bit. So let's talk about let's talk about ground floor understanding about jumping on Counters. So many people think that uh, they're like, oh, well, this is great, but my dog only jumps on the counter when I'm not there. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Think about that. Or talk about that thought or that reasoning <clears throat> and how we need to, you need to think about it differently. Yeah. So like I said at the top of the show, um, jumping up is a really rewarding behavior. Jumping up on people, jumping up on couches, counters. It's especially rewarding when they get to steal something or they get to eat something yeah. or they get a reaction from a person or, you know, some people like legitimately like pet them and play with them, then they jump up. All of that is just so rewarding. So um, we need to be careful that we we need to know that it's a self-rewarding behavior, which is why we basically have to go in, in two different um, directions in terms of how we are going to shape this behavior to be something better. Number one is going to be prevention, and number two is going to be uh, redirection or correction. Um, but the prevention is really the most important part, and that uh, sort of leads into what Ken was just saying. If your dog has a jumping up on the counter problem, and it's mainly happening or it's worse at happening when you are not in the kitchen, the answer is very obvious as to what you need to do. Dogs should not be in the kitchen yeah. without a human until the rules of the of the uh, kitchen are a little bit more uh, um, understood. It goes further than that. It's but. very obvious to us, but this is the yeah, challenge. True. You know, a lot of new dog owners think like, well, how on earth am I going to fix this problem? I need the dog. Yeah. You know, the dog needs to be in the kitchen because I don't want him chewing up the or peeing on the carpet or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. But this is an important realization is that if you, again, I, I, I kind of um, mentioned this at the beginning, you know, in an absence of information, whatever feels good, tastes good, works for the dog, they're going to think that's the right thing. Mm -hmm. So you do need to uh, manage the dog, bet your dog better. If, they're, if you're having issues with jumping up on the counter, and that could include no access yeah. to the counters when you aren't there. Oh, excuse me. Um, sorry, I, just for a second. I, there, there's lots of, there's lots of like, what's the word I'm looking for? There's lots of like, there are rules in in, uh, in dog training, and then there are, I don't know what the other the word is that I'm looking for. There are, um, search of the P, mm, can't quite get there. Uh, I'm not on your level okay. right now. Anyway, the rules. The rules are, you know, set in stone. So manage, managing your dog appropriately is a rule. There's lots of things that are open to, like, interpretation and adjustment. And, you know, sometimes you do this for one dog. You do something else for another. But mm -hmm. managing is, a good, is an important rule to follow. And some of the things that you can use for management are things like a house line or a house leash, mm -hmm. baby gates. Maybe it's a crate. There's all sorts of ways to make sure that you're keeping your dog safe by not allowing them access to some of these things where they could get hurt or make bad choices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
it's also important to understand that supervision is really important, but supervision followed then by action is also important because I find sometimes if dogs are only jumping when you're not in the room, chances are they are jumping on the counters when you're in the kitchen, but probably they've jumped up and you maybe have gotten to the point where you can say, hey, get off there, and they'll and they'll get off. And you think, oh, what a great dog. Well, we don't want them jumping up in the first place. So when we use the command off with our dogs, that's the, the don't jump up word that we use, really off maybe we need to think about a a better word but off to us doesn't mean get off it means don't go up in the first place so when i'm supervising my dog and i'm in the kitchen and i see my dog start to give some initial signs that they're thinking about jumping that could be circling the island that could be air scenting that could be you know looking at what's up on the on the counter that is when i am going to say something to the dog hey off or leave it and i'm going to react to the thought of the jumping rather than waiting to the dog actually jump. And why this is so critical and literally could change everything with your dog is dogs need really great timing. And if my dog is able to jump up on the counter and even if they're up for a few seconds and then I'm, you know, getting them off, the crime's already been committed. They've already gotten up there. They've already checked out. They've already got that scent. They've already done the thing. And for a lot of dogs, even if they've gotten to get up for just a moment, that's actually rewarding enough yeah. that they'll happily get off, but it doesn't mean that, you know, 10 minutes later or tomorrow or the next day, they're going to jump back up again. So if you're trying to um, really fix this issue, prevention needs to happen by supervising your dog well enough that you actually see the thought process happen of your dog thinking hmm I smell a steak thawing up there I think I might want to jump up on the counter and check it out well that's when I'm going to step on that house line that Ken has just suggested or that's when I'm going to give my dog hey leave that on your bed go get your bone and I'm going to give my dog a different direction give them something else to do if I'm a good preventer and I'm a good supervisor I don't really have to correct the dog because I'm ahead of the game. I'm one step ahead of the dog and I don't have to have a lot of discipline with with the dog in that moment. Whoa, what is that thing? It's a bug. It is giant. So the other thing to keep in mind is that, do do you guys know what air scenting looks like? Show us, show us. Well, I mean, uh, show us. so basically the dog would tip its head up and it would stand almost stock still. You know, there's going to be that moment where the dog like settles in and you can tell there's, they're not, they're, they're really focused on scent smelling. They're really focused on, oh, what is that smell? Mm-hmm. And that early intervention by you is so much easier than having to pull them off the counter or you know, uh, having to try to stop them, especially if you have a big dog. And maybe you have a great big dog, like Instructor mm-hmm. Steve, um, when he had Sky. I was found, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a different, uh, that's a little different um, uh, process, teaching that dog to stay mm-hmm. off the counters. Mm-hmm. But the steps are the same. The yeah. early intervention is so important. Yeah. So guys, you need to really understand that the earlier you can identify that your dog's thinking about jumping up, tell ah, off, leave that. Or whatever words you want to use, your dog's gonna think, how did they know? How did they know I was gonna jump up? They were that good. That's right. And once you've sort of redirected their attention, then you can start, you know, you can start working on this. Let's mm-hmm. talk a little bit about um, I need to ask you, did you catch that bug? I did. Because it's disappeared now, so where, That's right. where did it go? I caught it. <laughs> very distracting. I don't know if it flew by the camera, guys, but it was very large, and Ken just grabbed it in the air in his bare hand, and now it's gone. It was the size of a small bird. <laughs> anyway, so, so this, 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 is, something, this is something that we'll talk about, and actually yes. I think we've uh, published a couple of videos specifically on this, and I think we did it with Beeline, because she, w- she uh, just loved cheese. Now... Okay, let's talk about... Do you you want to talk about the setup? I think so. Let's talk about the setup, how you at home can work on this. Yeah. Teaching your dog to make a choice. Yeah. So what Ken's alluding to is, you know, we can't... It's difficult sometimes to, you know, if you need to be in the kitchen and you need to be cooking dinner or helping your kids with the homework or whatever you're doing, it's also then hard to you know, be dog training at the same time. So you need to kind of pick and choose your battles. If you feel that, you know, when you're around the counters, you're going to be a little bit disengaged from the dog because you have other things to do, you would be much better off in those moments to put your dog in their crate for the time being so that they don't have the chance to get up on the counter when you're not paying attention and get away with it. So keep that in mind. In addition to that, though, because dogs learn through repetition, one of the absolute best ways to work through jumping up is to set the dog up 
to think about jumping. So then you can then train them to not jump. This works with people. This works with counters. But since we're on the topic of counters, we'll keep the direction there for now. Um, so we did this with Beeline. We also did this. Remember, we did this with Hummer with the um, coffee table when he was oh, a, yeah. a lot younger because yeah, he yeah. was a little bit bigger dog and his size was very convenient for the height of our coffee table at the time and um i remember one time as a puppy he literally jumped on top of the coffee table and wanted to like get inside the bowl of popcorn right. and uh he didn't think anything of it he's a puppy he doesn't know any better um so with those two dogs and with many of our other dogs we actually set the dog up to think about jumping so we could actually work through the situation so with b um we put some cheese on top of the counter we put some of her favorite toys on top of the counter and we were ready and prepared with her house line or her leash on and um we would basically we were trying to provoke her to say oh my gosh my favorite toys up there i want to jump so that we could actually work through it and the moment she started some of those initial signs that she was thinking about jumping I was able to say off and then use the line. I could step on the line with my foot. I could grab the line with my hand and redirect her um, and then get her doing something else. And of course, because her favorite toy was up there, she went to go in and investigate and jump up a couple times. But I was ready because I was I was purposeful about what I was doing. And um, she learned pretty quickly that that just wasn't allowed while I was there supervising. And we can certainly talk about when you're not in the room as well. But when you set them up, it allows you to be ready for what's about to happen. It allows you to have good timing. It allows you to redirect much more clearly. Yeah. What happens is when we're in the kitchen and the dog's running around and there's lots of things happening and you know maybe we've done some great training, but now we're a little bit distracted and the dog's gotten up on the counter if they've stolen something or if they've done something we're not paying attention because we're busy. Well, now you've just gone, you know, you went three steps ahead with your great training session, but now you're 10 steps behind yeah. because you just were a poor supervisor. And that happens because yeah, life sure. is busy. It doesn't yep. mean that you're a bad dog trainer or a you know bad owner or whatever. It means that you're a normal busy person and you just need better management tactics so that until your dog is trained and they have the ability to be loose and hanging out in your family all the time, you are either paying attention and you're watching them or they're in their crate. So you have the best of both worlds. Lots of links just dropped a uh, link to the stop counter surfing. Now we don't, um, I mean, we don't buy a lot of cheese slices, but when we have a puppy in the house, I'll tell you something like those, uh, what are they, processed cheese slices Cellophane. are great because they're so malleable, uh, you know, like you, you can make different shapes. You can hang them over the edge of your countertop and uh, really work on some of those exercises. But remember, your dog, your dog's not jumping up there to spite you. Your dog's no. not jumping up there to be, um, you know, silly or they they think there's something valuable up there. It's or they the want to know. It's the simplest reason. For sure. They, they're trying something to find value they want. <laughs> up there. So if you can transfer, as Kale talked about, with that setting them up, they choose they choose to not jump. They get rewarded on with mm -hmm. all four on the floor. You're transferring the value from up there, possibility of something good up there, to for sure something great right down here as you're sitting on the floor. Mm -hmm. I need to mention Mary H. Super Hi, Mary. sticker. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, for for the super sticker. You've turned the train station blue. Uh, so and pretty. It's nice to uh, see you here in the uh, in the train station. <clears throat> um, I want to move on. I, I, before we move on, I wanted to yeah. talk about two like training technique tips that are important. Okay, good. So if you are um, working with your dog and you do need to um, utilize the leash yep. to get your dog off the counter or stop your dog from getting off the counter, it's really important that when you use the leash that you use it by um, um, pulling the leash down towards the floor yep. rather than oh, yeah. back. Yeah. Um, and it's important that we say this because we don't want you pulling the leash back and then your dog like flipping back and hurting themselves or something like that. So you do need to make sure that you're, you're um, you know, maneuvering your dog downward with the leash. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that try to make sure that you're not rewarding your dog. So if you do go to, if you choose to reward your dog for not jumping up on the counter, make sure that you're not rewarding them in the direction of the counter. Make right. sure that you're not taking food from the counter and then rewarding your dog because that just sort of continues to pique the dog's interest from what's up there. Instead, it would be better to redirect the dog's attention towards you or even away from the counter. I might even have my dog go and, you know, lie in their bed or go in their crate and then reward there so that the um, idea is that it's really great over here here, it's not so much fun up there so that you're changing where th your dog feels the value lies. Yeah, Leah Kay, uh, dropping the super chat. 
Thank you for the super chat, Leah. Said, help with little dogs like Hippie Shake. So mm -hmm. the same steps will apply. Hippie -dippie -doo. Yeah, let's talk a little. I mean, the process is the same yep. when we're talking about little dogs like that. However, you probably got a dog who wants to jump more, likes to jump more. Mm -hmm. Certainly we see that with some of the smaller breeds because they're, they're often picked up. You know, they're often brought up uh, when, they, when they bounce around like a little goofball. They're brought up where the big dogs, big, you know, you know, more intimidating, bigger uh, dogs. People are like, okay, that's enough jumping. They jump once and it's like, okay, that's enough, buddy. We need to train through mm -hmm. this. But the little guys can get away with it more. So keep that in mind. Yeah. So, and, and we did all of the same things with Hippie. Hippies are, are she's a toy poodle. For those of you who don't know, she's about like seven or eight pounds. She's really little. Um, and she loves to jump. She loves to bounce, actually. Yeah. Um, and we actually taught that to her as a trick. She does it on a command, which is also great because we can then also tell her not to do it as well. Um, but in terms of like counter surfing, and things like that every step that I just explained to you we did exactly the same thing with her when she was a puppy in the house in the kitchen she was also on a long line you know we had her bed we had her crate we had all of our management tools there and we did all of the same things uh, regardless of her size so even though she's little she still had the same rules as the big dogs because we wanted her to you know understand the same things um we're, let's move on to jumping on people here yep. in a second but uh, Mary Beth DeMarco says I have a sound that uh, that indicates my dog no when she he runs up to uh, jump and greet my sister. I'm telling the dog no, but my sister likes it and doesn't even mind, even though I've said so. I don't like her jumping up. Yeah. Totally. I, I think this is important that you're also coaching the people, excuse me, that you're working with or that you're using as distractions. Yeah. But let's talk about the no for a second because it sounds like Mary Beth is making a great choice in her timing. Mm -hmm. She's using that no, but we don't use the word no. We specifically use the word off and why mm. is that yeah we try to stay away from the word no because it's not really giving the dog um no what like no no what like saying off has, has a specific it will have a specific meaning to the dog you also be, have to be careful and no is such a normal conversational word that you would use with you know family members and whatnot in the house so we we typically try to stay away from using no as a, a negative reprimand uh, for our dogs we might use ah, ah, or hey or something that's a bit more individual to the dog uh, but in terms of jumping you want to give tell them what they should be doing rather than what yeah. they shouldn't be doing um, and you'll find that when you build value with understanding what the word sit means or off, um, your dog will be able to understand to respond to that behavior rather than just telling them, no, don't do that. Um, I do want to comment on, though, on being in situations where you're making your best effort to stop the dog from jumping, but then the person that you're with is making your life a nightmare yeah. because they are like, oh, I love dogs, I don't mind. Or I know whenever I have a puppy, this was the worst with Hippie, actually, because she was so oh, cute with yeah. as a puppy. She was so little and fuzzy. Yeah, he's People would be like, oh, she's so cute. And they would get that high squeaky voice and it, she would just go mental. She was so excited. Um, and it was challenging sometimes to get the dog to be calm. So there's a couple things you can do. Number one, you need to explain to people that, you know, you're training your dog and could they help you? Um, you know, rather than saying, don't pet them, just ask them if they'll help you a little yeah. bit. Uh, and then you can kind of go two different directions. What I tend to do with my own dogs is my dogs have... Um, they're allowed to jump up as sort of a trick um, as long as they've been given permission. So if it's someone that I feel, um, you know, will be able to manage the dog jumping on them okay, I will often ask them to make the dog sit first or I'll make the dog sit first. We'll reward the dog for initially being calm and settled because that's what my goal is. And then if the moment's right, they could then say, okay, hop up, and they can let the dog jump up from there. But there are lots of people that I would never do that with my with my puppy. You know, my neighbors, for yeah. example, they love dogs, but they're not dog people. They don't need dogs in their face. So I would never give permission. I would, I would continue to keep my dog in that sitting position. So you can choose to do that if you want to, but regardless of whether you're going to allow dogs to jump up or not, you should always start with the dog sitting. And if you have a real wiggle bum or a dog that has poor emotional control, the idea of even letting them jump up might be coming later oh. in life, months down the road when your dog actually has more training and more reliability and they listen better to you. Um, so it is important that you that you are strict with that. Um, I know um, we had another a dog named Jitterbug, which maybe naming her that was 
part of our problem <laughs> because she was really wiggly. And I remember there was probably a good month where I didn't let her say hello to anybody because she was so wiggly mm-hmm. and she would actually submissively pee out of excitement that I would just go by people and I would have her sit at my side and people would, I'd have to say, don't even look at her, don't smile at her, don't look at yeah. her because it was too much for her. She'd be like, oh my God, come over and touch me. And so I had to work on just getting her to sit with the people as a distraction so she was around them, but not until she could actually kind of sit calmly and have a brain and not be holding be, me being holding on her a tight leash would I then have people start to come uh, towards her, which we can probably... I want, I want to introduce you to the idea of a training target. Mm-hmm. And this is something that we've talked about uh, before on the channel. And um, I've, I've just loaded a video in because as we were having this conversation, it seemed like really appropriate. And I th- watching the chat, I think there's this is something that a lot of you guys in the chat need to understand. I love this video. Um, Let's let, let's let Kale explain it in the video. We'll just uh, sort of narrate as needed. You let me know if you need it to be paused. Um, when you say let let Kale explain it in the video, it, 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 that it, it, video, or you want right. me to talk now? No, no. The, when the video starts, oh. you're actually coaching. But I let see. me know if you if you want it to pause. I think this will be really good for these guys. Ready? I want to introduce to you the concept of a training target so you know what a target looks like. I want you to think about those different areas as different thresholds that you can use with your dog to make things either easier or more challenging as your dog's training progresses. Kind of so if you look at the biggest yeah. um, circle on a target, it's the, usually the easiest one to achieve. So this is, in. Kale just mentioned jitterbug. So let's say, imagine jitterbug, and it's gonna be different for every dog. Mm-hmm. Like if your dog is super friendly and super hyper and just loves people, then your your green circle might be much wider. You know, and, that and you date, might be staying there a little longer than other right. people. That's <laughs> right, absolutely, yeah, for sure. So jitterbug's green circle would have been really big. Uh, and then as it went in, uh, you know, it, it got, it, if you have an excited dog, you need to have a bigger circle. Yeah. It's, it's sort of b- broken A bigger down bubble circle. away That's from right. distractions. That's right. It's going to be the same thing with your dog training. If you're working with your dog around other people, think about having those people stay Stop in the... For a second. So if you can see here, um, videographer extraordinaire Ken has made <laughs> our uh, our colors here. So you see Ken standing in the green. There's the yellow in the middle. And then the, uh, is that supposed to be red? I, I think so. Really uh, is where I'm standing. So basically, and I'm working with a really young dog here. A very excitable, very uh, very, friendly. very excitable young dog named Euchre, who, who has belongs to my brother now. But uh, she lived with us for quite some time. She's a real friendly girl. Um, but initially... Ken had to stay at that green bubble at a distance because that was the distance that he needed to be in order for Euchre to be successful. If initially, if Ken came any closer than that, Euchre would lose her, lose her mind and she would start to jump. And again, the whole idea with the McCann method of training is we're trying to set the dog up to be successful so that we can tell them right that they're right far more than we tell them that they're wrong. If we let people come right into that, you know, inside bubble, into this red section, um, and you know your dog's going to jump up and make a poor choice, then we don't really want to be setting that up. We don't want the dog to, you know, make the wrong mistake when we know that's going to happen. So I want you to to think about um, these areas as like a threshold (coughs) as to what your dog can handle. Biggest area of the target, the furthest away from your dog um, in order for your puppy to be successful. Now, if they're at a distance and your dog is able to sit on a loose leash, they're able to check in with you, they're able to be attentive, you can Uh, then have that person closing to the middle part of that target. They can come in a little bit. Okay, did you guys hear that? That yellow part is the training zone. I'm going to move this back just a touch. So this is really important because this is where you're working. Able to check this is in where with you're you, they're able to be attentive. You can then have that person close into the middle part of that target. They can come in a little bit closer. And this is where, really where you're going to need to work your butt off. Now, it doesn't all need to be perfect. It's okay if somebody starts to get close and your dog makes an error. But what you do about that error is going to make all of the difference. Let's talk first step. So you're out for a walk with your dog. Your dog happens no. to... I know a lot of you guys are in this specific situation. You go out for a walk and you're maybe working on your leash walking training. You think, oh no, here comes somebody. Oh, there's the neighbor. Mm -hmm. This is going to go horribly. Pay attention to this next part as we uh, go through what you can do to teach your dog to remain on the ground and, and be rewarded in position. Find more value for that than jumping on strangers. See somebody did it at a distance. You can kind of tell they're going to come in to want to say hello to your dog. What's the first thing that you should do? Well, the first thing you need to do is get your dog's attention before they get locked on to that distraction. So I might interrupt her. I might use a bit of food. Hey pup, what's this? 
hey, hi, what's this? And I might lure her into my side and go to a control exercise that she's been working on. So she understands that when she's sitting at my side, yes, that she needs to remain in that position, Positive even reset. though there's... So the other thing that's really important about teaching your dog not to jump up is that it's not just about teaching them not to jump up. It's about teaching them what to do instead. So we really recommend that you work on some basic obedience skills so that you have you know, some some tools in the in the tool belt before yeah. you head out on the street. If your dog doesn't I think it just stung me or bit me, whatever it was. I thought you killed it. I did. Well I it's thought a, it was, it's I alive again. It. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um if uh your dog um I've lost my train of thought because uh, you, you need to have obedience bug. skills. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, if your dog doesn't know how to sit or if they don't know how to hold a sitter, they don't know how to pay attention to you, and then you're going out on the street and you're, you know, coming across all of these people, that's sort of like a recipe for disaster. So yeah. it's really important. So in this video, Euchre is not um, rehearsed in, you know, greeting people at yet. That's what we're working on in the video. But what I had done prior to working on this is taught her that sitting at my side on a loose leash was really important. So that's why some obedience skills need to come into play before you're going out. Now, if that your dog doesn't have those obedience skills, then that tells you that you shouldn't really be out around a bunch of people um, until you're able to accomplish that first. This is really important because... So many people don't do that. Yeah, totally. This is something that is so important to understand is putting your dog in situations where they're likely to be right. So yeah. if you have a dog who you're struggling to get control of or you're struggling to take for a walk or you're struggling to stop them from jumping up on people, then you need to be really careful that you don't put in these situations where you're testing them yeah. you're testing them again you're testing you need to be focused on training when you start to get that great leash walking then you can go a little farther you can go a little more distracting yeah. environments when you're starting to get your dog choosing to sit at your side then you can start working on the jumping up training but if you if you're constantly testing them it's it's, it's gonna set your back set back your training your dog's not going to really understand what you want because you can never get it mm -hmm. you're also just likely going to find have find that your dog is frustrated and doesn't really know what it is is that you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's jump back to that training video. So again, what I'm teaching is, um, Uker is that it's far a far better choice to sit beside me on a loose leash and, and be calm than it is to to jump on people. And yeah. so we've built a lot of value into uh, what she's doing now. And you can do this at home very, very easily. Actually, yeah. you might talk about but it. But we drill into them in the, when they're young to help teach emotional control. So my dog's in the control position. And as that person approaches, I'm just going to say, hey, how's it going? Just hold on. Wait there one second. I'm just going to instruct them to just sort of stop at a distance. The coaching part. Don't forget the coaching part. It's going to be really important. And I know for a lot of uh, uh, people in our audience, they're going to say, like, oh, it feels awkward. Like, it's kind of, I you know, know I, I hate saying that. But uh, it's important. And you I'll tell you, especially for those people that are dog lovers that see on the street and they're like, oh, I just love dogs. Say, oh, that's great. Actually, you know, we're in training. He or she's in training. Can you help me out for a second? Mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be great because we're really working on something that, uh, you know, or whatever. Um, you're going to see those people light up and like, oh, yeah, I'll help. I'll yeah. help you do your training. So, you know, be, uh, be, uh, don't be afraid to communicate with someone who approaches you on the street. Like, oh, we're just in training. Can you actually help me for a moment? Or you can say, actually, we're just in training and he's not quite ready for that. So, uh, you know, maybe another time we'll come back and see you. Yeah, I, I always do this, you know, with our young dog now. There's lots of times yeah. if I stop on the street and I have him get in and sit, I'm literally looking at five and I'm not even looking really at the person. So I'm like, yep, yeah, okay, cool. Yep, yeah. Yeah, he's young and I'm feeding him good boy that's it like my focus is really on the dog it's not forgetting him and then talking to the person because I, I want to be able to give him good information so as long as you're polite with how you talk and you just kind of explain the situation um, people typically are quite responsive to this you just have to be a good coach of the person and also your dog yeah, yes Albert I says, love that Albert yeah okay uh, let's try good girl okay come a little closer Yes, good girl, good sit, yes. And my focus is gonna be more on the dog and less go. on the Just person. Like now, if I see- This is the hard part. And this is something when we're working in, in our in-person classes or on our online training classes, like keep convincing people that you're focused. It, we naturally wanna be focused on the person, mm -hmm. but you must be keenly focused on the dog. Yeah. Cause that's when you're gonna see them start to get up. You'll see them rock forward. And that's when you can remind them to remain in position or put, or put them back. But your timing is so important. So if you can replace them back in yeah. before they have a chance to get four feet away to get over to that person, it's gonna be massively helpful. But to do that, you gotta have your eyes on them. 
Yeah, I have something else to add to that after. Yeah. Do you want to go back to this? Or no. You... Well, I was just going to say that there's just so many people that say the worst thing is when people ignore you and they say it's okay, I don't mind. Yeah. So, you know, not everybody has the ability to be, you know, controlling the situation. I know that can be really difficult. Um, so the other thing that I'm, tr- I, I'm very careful with when I have young dogs in training is – where I take my dog, it's always, I always think about it ahead of time. Yeah. So I'm not just going to like, I don't go, like we live near a, a public school um, and at certain times of the day, there are kids and cars and people everywhere. Yeah. I, when five was younger, I wouldn't go outside during that time because it's just too distracting. There'd be too many random dogs or be too many random people. So you need to also think about putting your dog in a scenario where it's a little bit easier, you know, easier to control them. And I know that not everybody has the ability to control, you know, if you live in like downtown New York City, you're around people all of the time and you're going to have to work a little bit harder, unfortunately. Uh, But if you do have the opportunity to pick and choose, you know, go into these distractions slowly and gradually as your dog it starts to become ready for it and you will see more success so many people put their dogs into situations that are just overwhelming and it's impossible for the puppy to be right and then we just end up being mad or frustrated with other people or the dogs and it's it's not um, the most effective way to train yeah i know a lot of people say like oh well you know it's always busy and i'll tell you we have students from 60 countries and i'm talking like all over the world and you know a student in downtown manhattan uh will have a different training situation than someone who's in you know rural Idaho yeah but it both of those people might be in an area that's really busy or it's like really distracting for their dogs so it, I want you to think about finding uh, you know, putting in a little more effort to get to a place where you can do your training or building more value at home in in your home so you can build more value on these exercises then slowly introduce some of those tough distractions mm-hmm. I'll tell you that I don't I You know, I find it frustrating when people just say, oh, we can't for this reason or that reason. Uh, You know, we can't train that because of this thing or that other thing. My dog doesn't like this or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you really want to get the job done, you'll figure out how to make it happen, guys. We see it all the time. We used to go to Toronto for um, Wolfstock for these big shows, and they were amazing. And uh, downtown Toronto... In Ontario, so Canada. many people. Yeah, tons of people. It's all concrete. There's nowhere to go. But beforehand, when we go for setup, we'd find little spaces that might have a little grass strip, a little boulevard, somewhere we could get a, maybe it's even in an alley that's like relatively clean. So we could get our dogs away and they could do their business, but we could also get a young dog away and do a little bit of training that was qu- a little more quiet, mm-hmm. less distractions, safer for them. So, um, you know, really, it's really worth your effort. It, it really is. It'll make your training easier, make it more fun yeah. too. Okay. Let's get through this darn video. Yeah. <laughs> that she's, oops, if she's over distracted, she can't hold that sit. I'm just going to ditch the food and I'm just place her. <laughs> You're like melting. Sit, good girly. I'm going to place her back into that sitting position. And once she's on a loose leash, there's my Papa Rooney. I'm going to yes and reward once again. Okay, you can come in and try again. Sit, yes. Now, if she's able to hold the sit as that person gets close, I can then say, all right, you can pet her. Good girl. Oops. Oopsie. So I want her to maintain that sit, even though she's being patted. So, you see so how she gets I up. I had C- the Ken up. come in and not just go right for the pet. He actually approached and he just stood there for a second. And, um, you know, you might even start out by having your family members help you with this so that you can actually coach them with what to do rather than just a random person on the street that just wants to pet your dog. Um, but, you know, Ken came in and he stood just there. And Euchre had a second to kind of look at him, look at me, get rewarded. And then I said, okay, go in for the pet. And you could see as soon as he went in for the pet, that was too much for Euchre. Euchre got up right away. But yeah. instead of talking to Ken, I just ditched my treats. I placed her back into that position. Position. Again, dogs learn within one second. So you can see I'm doing it very quickly so that Euchre can put two and two together that I, I want her to maintain the sit. But as soon as she's sitting, I put Slack back in the leash right again because mm-hmm. I want Euchre to make the decision to stay there on her own. If I just completely hold her on a tight leash, she's just going to turn her brain off and she's not going to have to think you know, right. for herself at all. So I'm going to be okay with her making poor choices because I'm just going to help her through them. But then I'm going to give her the opportunity to make the choice independently so I can then hopefully get a reward in, which is hopefully going to happen very soon in the video. Opportunity to be padded sort of is is non, not on the table anymore. Try again. 
Yes, good girl. Go. Yes. So you good see, I'm girl. feeding her at the same time. Yes. Now the next thing that I can do is I also could give her permission to go and say hello. But when I do that, I'm going to keep my leash handy, and I'm going to instruct that person just to be calm. Now another issue that we've had with Euchre is that if she's if starting to feel um, a little bit she gets up, I overexcited, put her sometimes she'll consistent. actually submissively pee, and it's even worse if people are squeaking and squawking and bending over top of her. So I'll often just encourage people to either stand up tall or bend down and, and sort of keep their body upright and then I'll let her go and say hello good okay good go say hi okay go say hi hi buddy off good oh. girl how cute is her face when she goes in girl hi. good hi. off hi. yes so good girl yes now you don't necessarily have to food reward your dog in this moment yes she took mm. yeah this is important good so you girl. don't necessarily have to food reward but if your dog chooses to remain with all four feet on the ground you can food reward them you know this is the thing you need. This is why jumping up is a challenge for a lot of you at home mm -hmm. is because this being petted by someone, <laughs> being able to jump up on someone is naturally rewarding for them. Yeah. Food is, you know, nice for some dogs, but not that important, mm -hmm. you know, so there is value in simply getting petted here. Look at my face. Yeah. The food there, but she could really care less. Crazy. What she really wants is love and affection. And as long as she's remaining in this sub sit position, I'm going to allow her to get that affection. But I also want to make sure that I have good control. So I also want to train her. Euchre. Yay! Good girl! I want the ability to get her back uh, to me and when I want now, her to. But because um, she's a puppy, I don't know if I'm, I'm really gonna going to explain what I just did there, but you'll notice that instead of just calling Euchre's name and hoping that she turned, I'm working with a very young, inexperienced puppy there, and she responded to her name uh, pretty... She responded to her name pretty well at that time without a lot of distractions, but I wasn't going to chance that she would ignore me there. So when I said her name, I used a bit of a couple treats on her nose, and I I lured her away from Ken so that she was successful the first time. I didn't, you know, leave it up to fate to decide whether she was going to listen or not. I said her name and then I showed her how to be right. And this is the key to success. Yeah. Show your dog how to be right yeah. so that they can replicate that themselves rather than putting them in a scenario where you're just letting them ignore you. I didn't let Euchre ignore me here. I made it very, very easy to, to do the right thing. Euchre. Yay! Yeah, good girl! Really I want the ability to get her back uh, to me and when I want her to, but because she's a puppy, I'm going to train her to do that. Shall we try that again? Okay, go say hi. You hi there, Papa Go say hi. hi there, I think you guys know what's happening. Go say hi. Off. Good. So I'm using off. off good. Off. Yes. So before she good jumps. Off. The office yes. a reminder Yooker. not to jump. Yay! Good girl. Yeah, and then I, get so I let her go her visit away. for just a moment and then I call her away. Let her go visit for a moment, then I call away. Keeping it nice and short and sweet. The longer I let her hang out there, the more opportunity there is for her to make an error. So I That's okay. important to remember. What? The longer that you let her hang out there, and people do yeah. this with their stay, they'll just wait and wait and wait and wait until the dog makes a mistake. Mm -hmm. But the longer let you, you let your dog hang out greeting that person, the more likely they are to eventually jump up. So make sure that you keep your these training sessions short and you are really clear with your expectations with your dog. Get them in, get a pet, get them out. And then you can start to extend some of the time when they, they're making better choices. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that I'm working with, Euchre's probably only like six months or something here like she's not very old maybe even maybe even a little bit younger than that um, but what happens is when you repeat that go in say hello for a few seconds and then lure the dog away it took about I think two training sessions and I could call Euchre off people right away because she had been shown what to do so many times. So when people say, well, you're just luring the dog with a treat, like they're only going to listen with food. Well, this is how we start it. This is how we, we make the exercise fun and enjoyable and rewarding for the dog. And then eventually we, we take those, you know, initial treats away and we use them more of a reward until you don't need them at all because the dog can do it independently. So I, I want to remind you that this is a training step. This is not forever. We're not bribing our dogs with food forever. But this is what we need to do initially to um, to get more success. Yeah, yeah, totally. And yes, that is Ken, and he's wearing a wig because we were trying to <laughs> be funny and Can make get, it more whoa, distracting whoa, whoa, whoa. for the puppy. Yeah, I, I wasn't trying to be Lots funny. Of I was being funny. Oh without her making a lot of mistakes. Okay, you know what I, I'm seeing a lot in the chat is uh, people are mentioning that, um, I thought it was good. Let, yeah. Drop yes in the chat if you found if you found that helpful if you found you know us breaking down one of the videos if you liked that if you you know it sort of maybe maybe saw it from a different you can like also um 
watch the whole video from yeah. start to finish as well. Yeah, I think uh, we can get the Dan the Moderator Man to drop a link in the chat. Actually, you know what Dan just dropped was our 40th anniversary retrieve trainers. Uh, we still have some Yay. left from the, from the celebration. So 40% off of our retrieve trainers. Uh, there, Dan's dropped that uh, link in the chat. Let's talk about... That's like Five's favorite toy right now. I know. Absolutely. <laughs> he loves that thing. So let's talk a little bit about um, jumping up on you. Like when a dog owner is not sure what to do because the dog's constantly jumping up on them. Mm -hmm. Let's a couple of steps or things that they need to think about to allow them to be more successful and have more control of the mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, it, it sort of goes along the same things as counter surfing and jumping on other people. It's the prevention that's so, so, so important. So you really need to think about, you know, what are the common times that your dogs typically um, want to jump on you? You know, jump on not other people, but, but yourself. Um, is it when you let them out of their crate? Is it when you're getting home from work? Is it you know, after you've called them back to you and they're a little bit stimulated and excited, like when is it normally happening? Um, if you're able to know that, then you're going to be able to predict it a little bit more easily. And in each of those scenarios, you're going to think of another behavior and an alternative behavior that your dog could do instead in those moments. And one of our favorites is what you kind of just saw that was happening in that video with Euchre just now is teaching the dogs to sit. Yeah. And I um, personally use this tactic in lots of different places with my puppies, um, even when I let them out of their crate. So, you know, when five was really little, he's 11, almost 11 months old now, but when he was really little, um, when we would let him out of the crate, he'd be so excited to see us that he'd be wiggling and jumping all over the oh, place great. and just being a wild man, uh, which was adorable, yeah. but also we didn't really want him to rehearse that. Yeah. So for a while, um, we would go to open the crate door and we would ask him to sit, or sometimes we would just have him stand there and I would open the door just about an inch or so. And if he went to barge out to jump jump on me, I would just very calmly close the door once again. And I wouldn't open the door completely until five was settled. And when we first started it, we opened and closed that door many times because yeah. he just didn't understand the game. But once he put two and two together, that calm behavior meant I would open the door. We had a very different minded puppy. And when you have a calmer minded puppy, he would come out and he was far less interested in jumping because now he was a bit more calm and I could put the house line on him. I could have him sit and it was easier to prevent my, my issue. Um, same thing. Another time that, that he would do a lot of jumping is when I would call him. He would run up and he'd be so excited. So we would teach him to sit. So we would get close before he would get too close to us, about 10 feet because he's really fast. So, yeah, so this is important. We would stand up tall and get some treats and lure him into a sit. We wanted him to learn that that behavior was more rewarding than jumping on us. But yeah. the, again, the only way you can do that is to get that new behavior that you're looking for to happen before the dog has a chance to jump. So that means you need to control the scenarios that yeah. you're in with the dog much more greatly. The dog needs to be on leash. Um, maybe you control the speed or the area in which you're interacting with the dog. Maybe you control the people that you're around. Maybe there are certain people that egg the dog on more than others. Um, but you want to try and, you know, be one step ahead of the dog. Yeah, and you're sort of thinking big picture of the dog training. Hmm. Sue K, thank you for the super chat. Turn this train station green. Uh, Sue says, I have trouble seeing the signs that my six month am staff is getting ready to launch himself on me what do i watch for and Good how question. do you train for this scenario mm -hmm. well to go in line with what i just said uh sue you want to try and think about the times in which it normally happens but in terms of actually reading the dog's body language there's a couple things that dogs will do that will show that they're about to, to jump on you um, or even on other people um one thing will be um a lot of eye contact um, wiggling, wagging their tail, but I would say the biggest indication is they start to coil, and when they coil, you know the jump is coming because right. they're about to spring up like a like a bungee cord. So, um, you know, when you just get the initial excited behavior, that's really when you want to be asking for the sit before they have a chance to jump. And I, as I had just mentioned with five, um, we would have to say sit really early because he was he would come in so yeah. fast yep. uh, that you know sometimes it was hard to to get. Um, 
ahead of it. So, um, you know, giving commands early so your dog has time to respond uh, can be really helpful. And make sure you have a leash or line on because as your dog gets close, you want to stand up nice and tall. People also make a lot of uh, a big mistake of getting down with the dog to try and stop the dog from jumping. And then they are moving their hands around. And for a lot of dogs, that just eggs them on. You would be much better to have a line on your dog or a leash, stand up tall and step on the leash or the line with your foot. And when the dog goes to jump up, well, they they just self-correct because they can't really they aren't successful you can just sort of stand calmly and when the dog settles then you can bend over a little bit and show your dog affection or reward them or um, engage with them when they're not attempting to jump anymore you know a big part of um, that incompatible behavior having them do something that's not compatible with jumping is basically giving your dog a job to do and this is something that I want you to keep in mind throughout a lot of your puppy training and your dog training is if you give your dog a job to do and you focus on training through that, then you yep. don't run into a lot of these nuisance behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't want to get too far away from, you were talking about like how you interact with the dog. Mm-hmm. I see this all the time. So the dog, uh, person's working with their dog not jumping up, dog chooses to not jump up. And either the person doesn't do anything, yes. doesn't oh. acknowledge it, or is like, yeah, you're the best, ah, you get a treat, you get a treat, you get a treat. So there's a balance in between, depending on your dog. You do need, <laughs> excuse me, to <laughs> acknowledge the good stuff. You need to make sure that you acknowledge those moments when your dog has made a great choice and acknowledge them early. We, you talked a little bit about, mm-hmm. I don't want to leave Euchre in there too long. You guys saw that. We don't want to leave the dog like just fussing about for too long. Otherwise, she'll lose her brain. Eventually, she'll jump. But acknowledge early, yes, what a good girl for not jumping up. And then you can get in there and pet praise feed whatever needs to happen. I think it's also important to remember that if you're trying to teach your dog to be calm, you also need to be interacting with your dog calmly so you know when we were trying to reinforce um our dog for being calm and sitting in front of us the praise would be like good boy good off good settle good it's very calm it's very soothing the total opposite to ken's party that he was just having a second ago if you have a dog that's easily excitable you can amp them up so fast by the tone of your voice or the energy in your body so if you want them to be calm you need to be calm and controlled and that will help uh, resonate with the dog as well i do want to say that all of this is not a quick fix so you're not going to do like some of these things once and then magically your dog's not going to jump anymore especially if your dog's been rehearsing this for some time but if you are consistent about making sure you have good timing and all of those things you will see some pretty significant changes in a short period of time but it is it is a bit of work so uh, there's some pretty common misconceptions out there about jumping, and this used to be a part of our back room time. Ah, uh, yeah. And Savannah mentions, how do you, oh, I lost it. How do you interrupt a, a jump if you don't catch it beforehand? So many people recommend throwing your knee to your chest, and I don't want to do that. Yeah, so, we don't want you to do that either, no. Savannah. And there's some other things that you may have heard. Uh, maybe it's grab the dog's paws and squeeze them until he can't take it anymore. Uh, you don't want to be doing that either. We're so, not trying to hurt the dog or absolutely scare the dog. Not. And honestly, some dogs, if you were to like put your knee into their chest, if you were had like a, a, a black lab or something Big, like that, yeah. they would think that was f- oh, awesome. A blast. They would yeah. think they would come back this harder, really, because they'd be so excited. Well, it's playtime. Yeah. But but you know, this is what's so important, Savannah, and, and for anyone who's working on this, you need to work your butt off so that you're prepared to deal with it, so that you don't get in the situation where you're like, oh, I didn't see this coming. If the dog's out, if the dog's in a in any uh, environment where they can make the wrong choice. Maybe the leash is in your hand. Maybe you have a long line. You're always ready to work on it because you know it's a possibility that they might jump. But uh, don't don't do the knee to the chest thing because Mm -hmm. you could hurt your dog uh, or they could think it's a massive uh, wrestling session. They yeah. love that. And remember, you're never going to be perfect. We're That's not right. perfect. That's you right. know, you know, I there have been lots of times where my dogs have jumped on something or someone before I've had the chance to prevent them. Sure. That just happens. But what did you have so, on the dog? Yeah, I was just about to say that. So if that does happen, you should be prepared to follow through. So my dog's always on a leash, you know, in their training stage so that I have control. And at that point, I'm just going to get the dog off whatever they're jumping on and I'm going to work 
work this in at that point. And I'm going to follow through it at that point. I'm not just going to say, oh, well, I missed it. Go ahead and jump. Have a, have a party. Do your thing. I'm going to follow through at that point. But you have to have a leash uh, and well-fit collar and all of that stuff yeah. on the dog so that you can easily regain control if you need to. If your dog is off leash and they are jumping, that is a bad Bad dog owner. trainer, yeah, bad absolutely. owner, for sure. Not yeah. a bad dog. That's yeah. your. You are literally just teaching your dog it's okay to do that, and well, you it, and you probably don't want to do that. So you've got to be, um, you got to be better about training. I like Chris. Uh, Chris says my 11 month old Bichon Frise is insane. Uh, she jumps on me and, and gets serious air. She's Air Jordan. <laughs> um, oh shoot, I just lost it. There's something I was thinking about. Oh, and. People will say, well, I don't want my dog to be on a leash forever. I don't want my dog to be on a line forever. I don't want those mm-hmm. things. Well, the sooner you get on this stuff and you manage your dog uh, uh, appropriately and you give them great information, the less time that they're on these mm-hmm. pieces of equipment. Um, yeah. It's, you know, invest the time now when it's early so that you can like really, you know, uh, we get a puppy and we work our butts off for yeah. several months, like really working at yeah. it. To, you know, it's a it's a time investment. And you but- want to get to the point where you you know five doesn't wear a leash when he's outside anymore. And how I made that decision is because he wore a leash for so long, and I got to the point where I thought, huh. I can't remember the last time I've had to use the leash mm-hmm. because he's just listening the first yeah. time I ask him to. And at that point, I could then transition to having off-leash control. So 100%. you will see when you're ready to start transitioning away from some of these training aids that we're suggesting. But it comes with the behavior of the dog and it's not age dependent. Lots of people say, well, how old should they be? You know, how long, what's the time frame? There is no time frame. If you're a good dog trainer and you've got great timing and you're consistent, it will not take you long. If yeah. you're the opposite of all those things, you might never fix your problem. So you have to make sure that it's about the progression of the dog and not about some of those other things to quantify your success. Sunflower Child Care says, uh, us owners also must be trained. And that's what we yeah. do. That's exactly right. Literally and what we do. Absolutely. And um, I've seen a lot of people asking in here about like, well, how do I... How do I work with, you know, one of the instructors in the chat? Yeah. This is something we work on in our life skills program. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk re- very briefly about this. Yeah. But we are people trainers. We can get these dog training things fixed very quickly. But it's the people. When mm-hmm. we give you the knowledge, we help you to understand when to make the right choices. That's when, you know, it, un- it unlocks something for our, our, you know, the, our students. And they start to make good choices. They start to have a dog that listens better because they can choose the right thing for their dog. Mm-hmm. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about what life skills is. Yeah, if you have a dog that's over um, four months old, then you could, um, any age over four months, um, you could uh, take our life skills program. We have them both in person and online if you're not local. And um, we work a lot on teaching the dogs not to jump up. All of the things yeah. that we talked about tonight, we show you step by step exactly how to go through that. And then on top of that, we give you personalized feedback about what's happening with you and your dog. But on top of the jumping up, we also work on teaching them not to pull on the leash, to walk on a loose leash at your side. Um, we teach them how to come when they're called around distractions. We teach a lot of other emotional control exercises. Well, and, the it, biggest thing. Here, here, sorry, here's the thing is, you know, we talk about all the things we're teaching, but it lets you get out to the park mm-hmm. that, and your dog will listen. It lets you go for walks and you can have fun again. You can have your coffee. Maybe it's a double double from Tim Hortons if you're Canadian, eh? Uh, you can walk down the street and you're not getting dragged. You can go and you know, you can go places with your friends. You can go to your cottage or cabin or whatever. And you can actually enjoy time with your dog because they listen and they want to listen. But the best part about our life skills and puppy essentials programs are the actual human interaction. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit? No, you go right ahead. I think we're good. I think we're good. That's good. (laughs) Good. Uh, so I think we've I think we've covered lots of really uh, uh, the really important stuff for tonight. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't want to drag this on too long, but um, the life skills program is. In I like what the Robbie chat. said. We teach you how to speak dog. Yeah, that's really we that's do. a big part of it. We do. I like that, Rob. We do have our retrieve trainers. Our 40th anniversary retrieve trainers are 40 percent off for you guys tonight. Uh, I, lots of links, Luton. I think dropped a link in the chat. I want to thank all of our uh, moderators for joining us here tonight. You've seen lots of the names oh, in blue. our Life Skills of course, we also do a weekly um, like personalized Zoom classes as well, where we all get together once a week and we do deep dives on things like yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, but it's a much smaller, more intimate group and um, they're tons of fun. We do them every single week. They're all recorded, so you can watch them at a later time. I'll tell you what they don't as have. As a student, you get access to all of that. They don't have tooting. 
They don't. We don't toot on the no. on the Zoom calls. No. It only happens here. Not on purpose, anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for joining us. If this is your first time here, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We're publishing videos every single week to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. Guess what tomorrow is? It's Kale's birthday. Yay! I've waited Yay. all week. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Okay. Happy okay. birthday to No, I got okay. this. No. To you. Okay, that's great. Happy birthday, dear Kale. <laughs> you're, you're li oh, Funky's getting in. You've ruined my birthday by singing that. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I hope we haven't ruined kidding. your birthday at home because with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest of my friends, well, that is up to you. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. Now, all of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you gonna train next? Happy training. <laughs>